Hey guys, in this video, we're going to start talking about primary immunodeficiencies. Um, this video is really an overview. Um, each of the following videos are going to go into the different types. So um, when you think about the immune response at large, you can think of it, you can kind of compartmentalize it, right? Like we're very well aware of cell mediated immunity and that there are certain patient populations that have basically acquired cell mediated immunity immunodeficiencies. So these would be patients with cancer, um, patients who have undergone some form of organ transplant, certainly our HIV and AIDS community, and then also patients at the kind of spectrums of life, be it very young or very old. All of these patients exhibit an acquired cell mediated immunity, but there are patients who are born with a um, immunodeficiency in the cell mediated compartment and they never grow out of it because I mean, yes, everybody when born is slightly cell mediated immunodeficient, but there are some patients that for some sort of genetic reason are lacking in cell mediated immunity. The same can be said for the other compartments of the immune response, the humoral immune response, the innate immune response. If you think about the immune response in general, if there's a compartment of it, there's a way for it to go wrong. And so in this video, we're gonna lay the groundwork and then there will be a separate video for cell mediated immunities, humoral immune mediated immunity, immunodeficiencies combined, which is basically you lack both cell mediated and humoral, and those are often referred to as SCIDs or severe combined immunodeficiencies, and also innate immunodeficiencies. Innate immunodeficiencies typically refer to things like LAD, which is leukocyte adhesion disorder, um, complement immunodeficiencies, and then things like CGD, which obviously um, that has to do with phagocytosis. So those are kind of the areas we worry about there. So this is pretty much what I was kind of trying to summarize on the previous slide. Um, primary immunodeficiency disorders are really serious and life-threatening conditions, and they all have a genetic basis. That's what makes them primary as opposed to acquired. They almost always present very, very early in life. Um, think about it. I've kind of made this joke before, but babies, for all intents and purposes, basically have a death wish. Like they're constantly putting things in their mouths. They have no immune response to protect them. And they are constantly being passed from person to person because everybody wants to snuggle the new baby. That's a lot of opportunities for a very new baby to get sick. So if they do have a primary immunodeficiency, you're going to start notice these children getting ill pretty, pretty early. So from they can be diagnosed anytime from the first day of life to a few months or even a few years of age. Um, the incidence of primary immunodeficiencies is very low. Thankfully, most of these are very unlikely. Um, it's about approximately 10 in every 100,000 persons, um, or sorry, person years. So making it even more um, rare. Um, the good thing about it is that if we know you have it, early diagnosis is actually very, um, can be very life-saving because we can give um, some treatments that will help mitigate some of these conditions. Inherited defects and in genes that compromise the immune system are basically what is going to cause your primary immunodeficiency, and that's what leads to your increased susceptibility to infection. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, you basically have four different types, right? So this first one, antibody B cell, hopefully you're all just looking at the going, oh, humoral. And then cell mediated is pretty much T cell. The statistic for that is included in combined. Why? I think you could probably figure this one out. So when we think about T cells, hopefully you're thinking about CD4 positive helper T cells. Remember, CD4 positive helper T cells are required to make antibody class switching happen, right? If you don't have CD4 positive T cells, you don't have any T cell help. So that's why we kind of include that because a lot of times a breakdown in the T cell compartment leads to a breakdown in the humoral compartment, which means now we're dealing with a combined immunodeficiency. About 18% of patients will suffer from some sort of phagocytic immune system um, defect. Again, this is something like CGD, which I know we talked about a lot last year. And then your complement immunodeficiencies are thankfully relatively low, only 2%. But think about it, we have three different pathways for complement. 
So there's actually some redundancy built into the system, which probably helps keep um, many of the complement deficiencies at a subclinical level. Okay, so how do we actually go about recognizing um, immunodeficiency? Well, there's this nice graphic that's put out by CDC and various other sites here that kind of, I think, explains it pretty well. Um, kiddos with primary immunodeficiency frequently come back with infections that are really hard to cure. And that's kind of the key. So, you know, we get a bacterial infection, we go to the doctor, you get an antibiotic, you get better, right? That's kind of the normal life cycle of an infectious disease in a normal healthy person. But part of this getting better, yes, some of it is the antibody response. Some of it is also the host immune response. The two are working synergistically. Okay, you've got antibiotics that are basically reducing the bacterial burden, but you also have the host immune response, which is reducing the bacterial burden together in concert. In these kids, there's no host immune response. So the antibiotic has to do all the work and that takes time. So they don't necessarily get better as quickly, or if they do, they may require multiple rounds. Um, this graphic says that approximately one in 500 persons are affected by a primary immunodeficiency. Now, that's probably true. There are some primary immunodeficiencies that are more common, but also less dangerous than others. So for example, I have this one here, one in 700. Approximately one in 700 persons suffer from IgA um, immunodeficiency. It's a pretty common one. Basically, it just means they don't have IgA. Really, the only readout here tends to be that you're a little bit more, more susceptible to some mucosal infections, like your staphs, your streps, um, and like rota and norovirus. Um, doesn't tend to be deadly. Um, most patients with IgA deficiencies are fairly subclinical. Um, but then there are much less common disorders like nucleoside phosphorylase defici deficiency, which has only been categorized in like a handful of patients. So that one I'm not even gonna teach you about because I mean, I think there's only been like 17 cases or something ever. Um, we more often see these deficiencies in men than in women um, because many of them are X-linked. So obviously that lowers the threshold. And as I said earlier, most of these patients are going to be diagnosed under the age of five. So what are we looking for when we're thinking about primary immunodeficiencies? First off, you're looking for chronic infections. So that gets at what I was talking about earlier. The other thing you might look for is recurrent infections. You know, if you're a pediatrician and you see 50 cases of strep throat, most of the time, those 50 cases, you're gonna give them some penicillin and it's gonna get better and they're gonna go away and they'll come back for their well check in a couple of months. When you have a kid that like, you just can't make that infection go away or they keep getting it or they keep making it get worse, then that's a problem. Um, the other thing is infection with unusual agents, okay? So there are some things that we expect to see kids get like strep throat, but if the kid's strep throat is due to something, you know, like Iconella or something, like that shouldn't be there. What is that doing here? That's a weird agent to have in this particular location. Um, with recurrent, another way of looking at that would be incomplete complete clearing of the microbes between episodes of infection or incomplete response to treatment. And that's what I talked about earlier. There are some additional clinical findings that you might keep in mind when thinking about a patient with a primary immunodeficiency. Um, one of the most common ones that we kind of keep an eye out for is skin rash or eczema. Um, for some reason, that one tends to pop up pretty often. Um, chronic or prolonged diarrhea is another indicator. Failure to thrive as kind of a characterization. Um, typically with that, we're thinking more um, reduced growth development or growth failure. Hepatosplenomegaly, if you have a patient who um, is exhibiting that in um, conjunction with some of these other things. Recurrent abscesses, abscesses are uncommon. You shouldn't see a bunch of abscesses in a small child. That's just 
that's abnormal, you know. Um, same with osteomyelitis, especially if it's recurrent, okay. You get one incidence of osteomyelitis, eh, that's a little strange, not that weird. Um, but if you have, you know, a four-year-old that's had osteomyelitis three times, okay, now that might be something to keep an eye on. Um, so these are kind of the rules of thumb that I think are true for all of the primary immunodeficiencies that I'm going to talk about in the rest of the videos.